Hello fellow KYBers. Thank you for inviting me into your home for a while so we could share together around the Word of God. Before we do today, just let's have a little prayer together. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Please just come wherever we are now in each of our homes and show us a little bit more of yourself. The love of the Father, presence yourself with us and teach us by your Holy Spirit. Inspire us, guide us, challenge us, whatever we need this day. And just please, when we end our little time together, may we be that little bit closer to Jesus. Amen. So, we find ourselves fast moving into 2022, don't we? Which I guess we'd all hoped would bring us back to some semblance of normality, whatever that is. Um, yet instead, a word that seems to sum up how life tends to be for us is uncertainty. And just that very word can stir up that jittery feel in the tummy. And um, it's just everything that's unstable and shifting and just uncertain. And there are many words in the dictionary that um, expand its meaning, dubious, precarious, risky, unsettled. But this little phrase caught my eye and it says, all that does not know the truth. And we are most privileged of people to have been shown the truth. We believe God's word is truth and that God's word will last forever. And in these uncertain postmodern days when one can call anything they want truth, we really do need to know our Bibles. So relevant for our KYBers, well, and everyone, because we have something to share of the greatest importance that can bring stability and certainty to these days. So let's have a little look at 2 Timothy 1.14, which is what got me on this train of thought. Guard with greatest care and keep unchanged the treasure, that precious truth which has been entrusted to you. That is the good news about salvation through personal faith in Christ Jesus, through the help of the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. So I've just called this little talk, the muddle in the middle, uncertainty. Now, I'm very blessed to live in a beautiful little fishing village in Cornwall called Porth Leven, and it can be picture postcard perfect on a sunny summer day, but on a stormy winter's day, if I were to wave watch, as many do, this same place is transformed as the waves writhe tumultuously and they spew great heaps of power and foam and against the cliffs and the harbour walls. And there's a turmoil of unsettledness and thundering menace as the boats are sheltering in the little harbour. In the same way, all that is pounding at us is striking fear into the hearts of many and attacking the truth that can cause a muddle in the middle. Or it can be met with a knowing, a sure, a certain hope for both now, dealing with our past too, whatever that may have been like, and joy of joys, our future. So would you come with me to a great Old Testament story where uncertainty turned to certainty? And it's found in 2 Kings 6, verses 8 to 23. And I'm going to invite you, please, to read that for the best use of our time together. Some background to bring context. The prophet Elisha has become like an advisor to the king a bit like the scientific advisors to government during pandemic, 
um, when they were helping the government to make decisions about the vaccine and things like that, but with God insightfulness. And the planned Syrian enemy army attacks against Israel were revealed to Elisha by God and they were thwarted each time. And the then leader, likely Ben-Hadad, was getting angry and called his generals together. Now, look here, chaps, or something like that. We have a traitor in the midst. It's not us, sir, it's not us. Is that Elisha? Do you know he knows what the king is saying in his bedroom? Well, where is he, he says. I'll get him. Well, they find he's in a place called Dothan. Now, where before in the word does that place come up? Well, it's in Genesis, isn't it? Joseph, he was thrown into the pit by his brothers in Dothan, a place of two wells. And what started for Joseph was pit, prison, became palace, purpose. And the story ends, if you remember, with that lovely verse, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Two ways of looking at what happened to him. Keep that thought in mind a moment. Back to the story. All night long, they surrounded the place, moving stealthily in, chariots rumbling, Horses prancing, snorting, fearsome, stomping, getting into position around Elisha. And Elisha's servant got up early the next morning, to his usual routine, happily unaware, singing to himself maybe, da, 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 da. opens the back door to look out on the fine morning, <gasps> only to see. The place surrounded with chariots and horses. Oh, no! What is going on? His heart beat faster. He probably shut the door and went like that again. Did I really see it right? Palms are sweating. Knees turning to jelly. Oh, master, what are we going to do? And we can find ourselves in such situations and uncertainty. We don't even have to open the doors some mornings, do we? Before we're surrounded with thoughts, with worries, with fears. It's COVID. It's bills rising. How are we going to manage? Food supplies, health issues. You know, all this self-isolation stuff is, you know, it's not doing well for my mental health and well-being. Climate change. Now, what should I do about this? And nations posturing at the moment we have Russia and Ukraine, war threatening. Situations can be overwhelming, can't they? They crowd in and they're today's version of the chariots and horses. That old enemy of our souls comes in the night, insidiously, malignantly, creeping around us like a coiling snake, snake trying to squeeze the very life out of us. How are we going to cope? Do you have those thoughts? I know I do sometimes. I think things like, I don't have my parents around anymore. A father to protect, to talk to, or a husband to care. I don't have a, a special stash or pot of money anywhere that I can dip into if things get bad. But the word of God tells me that God is my father, 2 Corinthians 6.18. And the word of God tells me that he is my husband, Isaiah 54. And he is my provider, Philippians 4.19. He is my rock and my refuge, Psalm 18, verse 2. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, he is with me right now. Whatever I'm going through, Hebrews 13, 5, he is present 
giving strength, giving courage, and he will never, ever leave me or you. Now, Elisha was calm under this pressure, immense though it was, and the uncertainty of it. And we can be too, if we know our God. Because God is always a step ahead of the tactics of the enemy. Or every circumstance that life may throw at us, he is aware. So Elisha calmly says, don't be afraid. There are more with us than with them. Open his eyes to see. Let's get the father's perspective on this. Now this servant, he had got up early. He wasn't lazy. It's like as if the word is saying to us he'd had his quiet time with God, but then he opened the door. And he hadn't expected this. Suddenly, there's all this uncertainty coming in. Elisha's servant had been with him and served him for some time. He'd seen miracles before. He'd seen a commander of this very same Syrian army, Naaman, healed one time. But he's still shaken with these events. And so we can be too. But remember, Jesus in John 14, verse 9, he said to Philip, and he says to me, and you, if you put your own name in this, have you been so long time with me, Philip, Leslie, whatever your name is, and you really haven't known me? That's challenging, isn't it? He's saying, look, you're surrounded by chariots and horse of fire. All my protection is around you. And I'm the commander of this army who's looking after you. Remember that old song that we used to sing, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. It's often said, you know, that Celtic people have what's known as a thin place. That's a place where they felt God very near, where the border between this world and the next became transparent and spiritual things were more visible. And it can happen for us in prayer, in reading our Bibles, the word, when suddenly, or out in creation, when suddenly insight becomes clear and Jesus has drawn especially near to us. And we need to be aware of what's happening at those moments. Now, have you heard about Four Eyes the fish? No, really, there is one. There is a little fish in South American waters, also known as anablebs. And it's so cool because although it only has two eyes, they look like four. It swims near the surface of the water with these big bulging eyes half above the water and half below. And there's this horizontal band that splits the eye into two lobes with its own pupil and vision so that it can see out of the water and in the water simultaneously. Amazing. We need to see what's going on in our world alongside the word. We need to be reading our papers, hearing the news, but alongside the word of God, see what's unfolding. Because remember Dothan, the two ways, the two wells of looking at different things. The uncertainty of the here and now or the spiritual fulfillment of biblical prophecy making way for Jesus' return. Look with open eyes and hearts at the spiritual fulfillment of these things. See the chariots and the horses of fire. Whose view are we looking? The world view or the God view? Isaiah 31 3 says, The Egyptians are men and not God. Their horses are flesh and not spirit. But open eyes looking sees chariots and horses of fire. Faith is never imagining unreal things. It is the grip of the things that can't be demonstrated 
to the senses, but which are real. The chariots and horses of fire were actually there. That's a quote from Morgan. And Psalm 20 verse 7 says, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord. May the king answer when we call. And one of his names, word of God. And we can trust this word. Please permit me a moment to share a little experience with the car wash that I had. It's very simple, but real muddle in the middle of an uncertain happening in life's everyday events. I took my car for its little treat to have a wash and valet. And I'd used this car wash many, many times before. Only this day, when I drove up and said, please may I have a wash and valley, a man, different one than usual, gruffly said, no. So I looked at him and I said, you need to book. I said, well, I've never had to book before, I've just turned up. And he said, you need to book. So I said, okay. So puzzled and a bit bemused, I just went away. And... I drove back home and as I drove through the little village, a little coffee shop drew, drew me and there was a parking space just outside. So I thought, mm, I'll do this instead. So I went in and a lady looked up from a table she was sitting at and smiled at me and I smiled back, didn't know who she was. And into my head that moment came Ask her if she has a faith. What? Whoa, where did that come from? So I sat, ordered my coffee, glanced at her at the side of my eye, didn't say anything. And she, and I, she didn't say anything to me either. And again, this insistent voice says to me, ask her if she has a faith. Oh, is that you, Lord? Shall I? Should I? Anyway, I did. And she looked at me wide-eyed. She said, yes, do you? And she shared with me about how she'd just recently moved here. She was searching for guidance. She'd lost her way a bit with God. She was really hoping to get on track. And we talked about Jesus and the truth and how he can guide us and all sorts of things. I came out of that little shop thinking, what happened there? Even then, I had a Thomas moment and I went back into the car wash the next day, drove in as usual and asked for my usual wash and valet and they just said, go on through. Goosebumpy. But it was a look moment because this is the sovereignty of divine providence in action in just everyday normal living that we can have. But how much value do we place on these leadings from the word of God and his prompts to us? Do we believe it? Do we trust it? Even when we're in a muddle and it just is uncertain. Do you know, I read of an interpreter for the American government and for some missionaries called, and please excuse this pronunciation, it's probably not right, called Hein Pham. He got arrested and imprisoned. And the guards had tried to indoctrinate him with all this world's ideologies until he got to a place where he just thought, I just cannot take this anymore. And he said, I'm not going to believe. I am not going to pray tomorrow. And that very next day, that tomorrow, he was appointed by the commandant of that camp to clean the toilets. Most horrible, horrible job. But while he was doing so, he spotted a piece of paper with some English writing on it. Dirty, but he washed it off and he stuffed it in his pocket. And that night when his cellmates were asleep and by torchlight under his blanket, he got out that piece of paper and on it were these words from Romans 8. And we know 
that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not graciously give us all things? Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword? It is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And he wept. God, he said, you haven't left me alone for even 24 hours. And his guards were actually using the Bible, this word, as toilet paper. But the next day, he requested to go back and work again in those toilets because that bin held more paper and he washed it off and he took it back and he read it and it sustained him, it gave him hope. He eventually was in, uh, released from prison and he now lives in America. Open eyes saw his prison filled with horses and chariots of fire. In these uncertain times, we need to get in the word and we need the word to get into us. And if we're lacking in our knowledge of God or our relationship, we're going to struggle more with this uncertainty. But if we look at Jesus in the Gospels, we see Jesus as panic proof. Do you know those times when the crowds would come and they would be angsty and angry and against him? And all that he stood for and all that he was saying and, and sharing with them. And what did he do? He walked straight on through them. He wasn't harmed. Even up to the cross. He was at peace because he knew this was God's will and way. And he knew the whole story. And so do we. We've read the end. Revelation 4. The Lamb is on the throne. Uncertain times don't mean uncertain people. Someone said recently, I've never been more sure that God is doing something and I've never been more sure that I don't know what it is. But God says, 1 Chronicles 12, 32, that the sons of Issachar had knowledge of the signs of the times. And we can look open-eyed like Elisha and his servant as the Syrians come down to them, because stuff still happens. Do you know, they still came, despite them seeing the chariots and the horses of fire and being assured, It's they still came down. And someone else said recently, when muck happens, turn it into manure. Elisha prayed at that moment, God, blind them. Now here it means a sort of bedazzled, confuse them, a bit like Saul on the Damascus Road experience, until those same soldiers were led and found themselves in the midst of Samaria, right in enemy territory to them, not in a place they wanted to be, and sometimes neither are we, until, like them, eyes are opened. And the king then of Israel said to Elisha, shall we kill them? We've got them here now. But Elisha says, no, no. Set bread and water before them so they may eat and drink and go back to their master. Do you know, this has been our experience. We were captured, uncertain, but our eyes were opened whilst in the enemy territory of this old world. And God in his great love and his great mercy has set before us bread and water, the word and his spirit, so that one day we can go back and be with our master and Lord for all eternity. Elisha was sure of his God. He saw past the uncertainties to the certain promise that God 
was with him. And God is the God who is with us. The one who said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, set at liberty those who are oppressed, preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus knew we'd have muddle in the middle of all these things that we'd hurt. And he's commissioned us to do the same. So back to our verse 2 Timothy 1.14. Guard with greatest care and keep unchanged the treasure, that precious truth which has been entrusted to you. That is the good news about salvation through personal faith in Christ Jesus, through the help of the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. This is our privilege. This word that we have has the power to change lives. This word has the potential to impact the world. This word holds the promise to our secure future. No uncertainty. In spite of any circumstance we might find ourselves in, now or coming up, there's a quote from Pilgrim I'd like to end with. And he says this, My soul stood to attention, soaking in every word. Look. God bless.